Today we're going to be talking about patterns and nonlinear functions in section 4.3. Our goal is to identify and represent patterns that describe nonlinear functions. So to begin, we're going to define what a linear function is and what a nonlinear function is. This is at the top chart of your 4.3 note sheet. So let's see. A linear function is a function whose graph is a non-vertical line or a part of a non-vertical line. Non-vertical means not vertical, and vertical is up and down. So you can see three different examples below. We have a diagonal line, we have a diagonal dashed or dotted line, and we have also have a horizontal line. Those are all linear. And contrary to linear is nonlinear. And a nonlinear function is one whose graph is not a line or part of a line. As you can see below, there are three examples. The first one is a curve called a parabola. The second one is a cubic function. And the third one is an absolute value function. And all three of those are nonlinear because they do not graph like a line. So just like linear functions, we can use words, tables, equations, graphs, and sets of ordered pairs to represent nonlinear functions. So we will be using all of those representations during this lesson. In example one, we have two different graphs that we're going to be working with. We need to figure out if they're linear or nonlinear, so let's read the description. The area A in square inches of a pizza is a function of its radius R in inches. The cost C in dollars of the sauce for a pizza is a function of the weight W in ounces of sauce used. Graph these functions shown by the tables below. Is each function linear or nonlinear? You may be able to tell whether the pizza area and the sauce cost are linear or not, but we're actually going to be using graphs primarily in this example to figure out if they are linear or nonlinear. So to begin, let's work with the left side, the pizza area. Let's label the graph pizza area, and our axes are going to be the labels from the table, so I'll pause this and fill out the graph, and you can follow the same. As you can see, we have our graph labeled just as the table is below, so pause this to catch up, and then we will now plot the points. Now that our points are plotted on the graph, let's take a look at it. Does it look like a straight line? Actually, this graph is a curve, not a line, so the function is nonlinear, and we're going to write that down now. So now that we have that conclusion statement down, let's just briefly look at the table below. You can see that the difference between the areas is not the same number, so that's a giveaway that it's not going to be a linear function. Now let's take a look at the right side, the sauce cost. We just figured out what the pizza area looks like. Let's figure out what the sauce cost looks like. And we're taking into consideration the weight and the cost of the sauce. So take a moment to title your graph and label the axes and then plot the points. Now that we have the sauce cost plotted on our graph, let's take a look at it and see if it forms a line. Yes, it does form a line, so the function is linear. And we'll write that now, and we'll take a look at the table a little bit, and then we'll be done. Now let's look at the table. You can see that as the weight goes up, the cost goes up. And it's a uniform increase. It's increasing by 80 cents each time. So that is another proof of why that this relationship is linear. Example 2. The table shows the total number of blocks in each figure below as a function of the number of blocks on one edge. What is a pattern you can use to complete the table? Represent the relationship using words, an equation, and a graph. So take a moment right now and just look at the picture of the cubes and the blocks. See if you see a pattern at all. 
I think what the first step that we should do is fill out the table. So take a moment right now and predict what you think will be the blanks in the table. What we're trying to figure out is when there are four blocks on an edge, how many total blocks are there? And when there are five blocks on an edge, how many total blocks are there? Do you see any pattern in the table? Specifically look at the first two columns of the table, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 1, 8, 27. How do you make the 1 become a 1? How do you make the 2 become an 8? How do you make the 3 become a 27? Well, the way that this works is what we're doing is we're multiplying the number of blocks on each edge times itself three times. Another way to write that is 1 to the third. That's how we're getting the total number of blocks in each figure. Now let's make sure it works for 2 and 3. 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8. 2 to the third equals 8. Let's check it out in number 3. 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27 and that works out. So 3 to the third equals 27. This pattern continues for the next two um, numbers. So 4 is going to be 4 times 4 times 4. Another way to write that is 4 to the third and that is equal to 64. So at right we can write the coordinate point 4 comma 64. And for 5 we have 5 times 5 times 5. That is the same thing as 5 to the third or 5 cubed and that is equal to 125. So the coordinate point that matches up will be 5 comma 125. This table will be really helpful when we graph. How about we write the words first in the equation and then we'll figure out what the graph is. So how do we figure out the total number of blocks? Well what we did was we multiplied the block number of blocks times itself three times. So we're going to write that now. The total number of blocks y is the cube of the number of blocks on one edge x. That sentence represents the relationship between each of these values. Now let's think of what equation can represent this situation. Well, what do we do with each x value? We cubed it. So our equation is going to be y equals, remember y represents the total number of blocks in each figure, y equals x to the third, or another way to say that is x cubed. So that is the equation that represents the blocks. Now take a moment to set up your graph and plot the points. Now that we have those points plotted, let's think to ourselves, does that look like a straight line? These points do not lie on a line, so that means that this function is nonlinear. We're going to write that as our conclusion sentence and then move on to the next example. As I just mentioned, this is a nonlinear function, so you want to make sure you write that down. And you may be thinking to yourself right now, are we connecting those points? Because usually we do, but think about the situation. X is the number of blocks on an edge and Y is the total number of blocks in the figures. So we're not going to connect them because we can only have whole numbers on each edge, a whole number of blocks on each edge. It doesn't make sense to have half a block on each edge. We're doing one, two, three, four, five, etc. So that's why we are, we are not connecting those points. Now let's think of a, of a function as a rule that you apply to the input in order to get the output. Remember input values are the x values and output values are the y values. So a function is a rule that you apply to the x values in order to get the y values. So let's now let take a look at example three. We're going to write an equation that describes a nonlinear function. We are given the ordered pairs 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 8, 4, 16, and 5, 32. They represent a function. What is a rule or equation that represents this function. And the easiest way to organize this information is to make a table to organize these x and y values. So take a moment to fill in the table on your note sheet and we will continue. 
Now that we have our coordinate pairs listed in the table below, let's try to figure out some equations that would work for these pairs. A couple equations that are possibilities are the following. y equals 2x, y equals x plus 1, and y equals 2 to the x. So let's test out each row of ordered pairs and see if they work. They all work for the first row, so that is good. Now when we plug 2 in, We get 4, that works. Now we plug 2 in for the next one, and we do not get 4. We get 3. So this is not it. Um, what about the last one? y equals 2 to the second. 2 to the second is 2 times 2, which is 4. So that works as well. So we're getting rid of this option altogether. Now let's keep trying the outside two equations for the next row. 3 and 8. So let's see if we input 3, are we going to get 8? input 3, we get 6. This equation does not represent the function. Now let's try this over here, 2 to the third. That just means 2 times 2 times 2. That is not 6. Don't fall into that trap. 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8. And that works. And you can test it out for the next two rows. When you plug in 4, you will get 16. And when you plug in 5, you'll get 32. And if you don't believe me that this works, let's take a look at um, the different rows I have. We can rewrite this as 2, 2 times 2, 2 times 2 times 2, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, 4 times, and the last one, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Wow, that's a lot of 2's right there. So as you can see, the number of 2's is directly related to the x value. The first row we have only have 1 2, the second row we have 2 2's, we, the third row we have 3 2's, etc. So the equation that works for this function is y equals 2 to the x. This function can be represented by the equation y equals 2 to the x, as you can see, and that completes example 3. So now you have seen this section. Feel free to ask me questions tomorrow when we go over this material. You can try the lesson check for this section 4.3 or you can wait until we do similar problems together during class. Just make sure you have it done before the next section.